Welcome to the September 18, 2008 edition of the Open Forum. Once again, we have the privilege and the pleasure of opening the Bible together. Now I say the privilege and the pleasure. Indeed, it is a privilege because I'll tell you, there's nothing more important or more wonderful than the Bible. But a pleasure? Well, it, it depends on how we look at this. You know, these are, these are difficult times. People don't like to be told that they have less than three years left on planet Earth. The people love this world. Uh, that is most people, unless you happen to be in a country where there is pestilence or there is war going on and there is are, are indeed some very dreadful uh, places in the world. But on the other hand, there are many, 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 many places of the world where people are are getting some enjoy, or either some or a whole lot of enjoyment out of life. And that's also true here in the United States. And uh, then uh, to be reminded constantly that we are only two years and eight months and right now three days from that time when God is going to uh, put upon the world the day of judgment and the and it will be right, right near the very end of the existence of the world. That is a big interruption in our desires, in our plans, in uh, all that we had been enjoying uh, as we have been living on planet Earth. And then to hear this constantly, constantly, all the time, that's the problem with the open forum. Uh, this is what uh, people are hearing. And, uh, and uh, finally, uh, you just want to somehow negate this, somehow stop this. One way to do it is, if possible, if possible, show that something that is being taught is a total, totally phony baloney. It isn't really true at all. And uh, there is a lot to pick on. Because at the same time that we come to these new, this news that we're only of, uh, uh, 32 months from the very end of, the, of, uh, uh, of this world as we presently know it, uh, that, that uh, along with that we have uh, gotten all kinds of new information. And you know, I, 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 I've been an elder in the... In, right in the heartbeat of a uh, conservative denomination. I've served in committees and mission committee and, and so on. And so I know how churches operate. And, you know, uh, throughout the church age, if someone came along with a, uh, a doctrine that was a little different from what they had presently been holding... Uh, that doctrine would not be accepted until it stood the scrutiny of committee meetings and and discussions and people writing about it for a long time. And then maybe it would not be accepted. And now here we come along and, and uh, uh, every other day it seems like, at least in the last few months, we have been coming along with major doctrines that have never been taught before starting with the end of the church age starting with the fact that uh, that the gospel that has been accepted in the churches has been a do-it-yourself gospel that cannot bring salvation Ooh, what a slap that is and uh, that Satan rules in the congregations Ooh, that's even a worse slap and uh, that God the Holy Spirit is not saving anybody any longer in any congregation. And then going on to say, I, and no longer are we to understand that Christ is coming as a thief in the night, but we know the very uh, day and month and year and can be very, very certain of it. 
And we know, we have found that our whole understanding of God's judgment plan has been haywire. And we've had to rethink of, to rethink all of that. And then on top of it all, we come along with a great big doctrine that Christ actually made the payment for our sins before he ever created this world. And that when he came uh, about 2,000 years ago uh, to die on the cross, that was not to make payment for sin, but to demonstrate how he made payment for sin. And so there's an enormous amount of material that can be picked on uh, and where people can say, you know, here, uh, I don't believe that. I don't buy that. Uh, look, look, uh, uh, this rationale that I want to offer. Now, let me tell you that uh, I, as a teacher, am really on the spot. I'm really on the spot because as I discover these things, and I, not only I, but as I learn from others, uh, as we discover these things, uh, I, the decision has to be made. Are we going to teach these things or are we going to more calmly hold them in reserve after all? Uh, the world is, the church has been going along for a long time. Why be a disturbing, be a disturbing influence? And the problem is when you're a teacher, you have no option. You have to teach it. Of course, of course. You have to make sure you're being faithful to the Word of God. That's one of the reasons that uh, Family Radio has prepared books like uh, Wheat and Tares and uh, The End of the Church Age and After. And now we're almost there. And uh, 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 I hope the Lord will save me. These books have all been very, very carefully written not to convince somebody of the truth of what we're teaching, but to show them how they, how this has come from the Bible. If they will, if anybody reads that, uh, any of these books very carefully and checks out to see if they're faithful to the Bible. And if they don't believe they're faithful, well then don't, don't, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Uh, we're not trying to start a new religion. We're not trying to I become notable or whatever. We're simply trying to faithfully direct people into the Bible. But let me encourage you before you get too critical and before you're ready to slap uh, uh, this whole thing down any way that you can, please read this material very carefully and then show from the Bible from the Bible why it will not work. Now, it is true that the Bible is written in such a complex way that that uh, you can there are some verses that you can make them say uh, two or three different things that are in opposition to each other. I emphasize that from time to time. And so it requires great care as we read the Bible not only to read that verse that we that we believe is teaching what we'd like to hear, but see if that conclusion is in harmony with all the other verses of the Bible, and all of that kind of homework has to be done before we get come to truth. So, uh, as I sit here, I I am not disturbed when people call me names or when they. Uh, try to come after me, and some nights, of course, I'm not quite as uh, quite as uh, I'm a little more tired than another night, and and uh, you know I'm, I'm not thinking quite as rapidly, and and then they can have a field day because they can kind of walk all over me. I, I understand that, and uh, uh, but there's another night, there's another night. Let's talk some more, and uh, because we must come to truth. And I uh, want to tell you before the Lord that before anything is put into print, we try very hard uh, to check and double check to make sure that it is true. Before I teach anything on the open forum, unless I say 
I am speculating right now. Uh, I, I will not will not develop that idea anymore uh, unless I know, unless I've done my homework, that indeed this is true. But even then, even then, uh, as people call in, there are times when I find that I am being corrected, and I rejoice because that means that now I'm going to be more faithful than I had in the past. Well, okay, just kind of a monologue to indicate where we are and what the nature of this program is. And and uh, don't feel sorry for me, whatever you do, uh, because I, I know that this is where God has placed me, and I and I'm going to try to patiently be as faithful and true to the Word of God as possible. And that's what I pray for constantly. But I also hope and pray that you who are being disturbed, and, and it is so, such an upsetting time to think that maybe we only have two or three years left and it's all over, and all my plans uh, for the future don't mean a thing at all. Uh, I hope that you will really be praying for wisdom also and recognizing this is the time when you really should be beseeching the Lord, Oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. But now this is your program, and so let's take our first call tonight. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, um, the, my question was relating to the fact that Jesus died for our sins before the beginning of the world. Yes. And um, his dying on the cross, you said in one of your previous uh, shows, was to manifest how he died for our sins. Am I getting that correct? I'm a little confused yeah, on that. How he suffered for how he our suffered. sins. That is why yeah. he was under yeah. the wrath of God. Yeah, well, to show us how he suffered. Right, I, but, but he was not laden with sin. It was very significant, you know, when he stood before Pontius Pilate. Now, Pilate was the judge, and he was a, he was a, a competent judge. And again and again and again and again, the Bible says that he said, I find no fault in him. I find no sin in him. And he absolutely did not want to have him uh, uh, crucified because that was a penalty for a, a vicious crime. And he could not find that. But finally, to please the Pharisees or the high priests who insisted that he be crucified, he finally gave the order, all right, let him be crucified. But not because he found any fault in him. In fact, uh, he, uh, I, I remember years ago, I used to teach, well, uh, he, he couldn't find fault because he couldn't see the fact that Christ was laden with all of my dirty, rotten sin. But I was wrong. I was altogether wrong about that. When he, was, when he came the second time, uh, or when he came well, actually the first time to planet Earth while mankind was here, uh, he, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he, he had no uh, sin laid upon him. He simply came to demonstrate uh, he was like a the spiritual... Uh, like a parable, an earthly story. This is the earthly story with a spiritual meaning, the spiritual meaning bringing us all the way back to a time before the foundation of the world. Now, just, just one other thing, and I'll get off. Um, you would, Another caller had asked you um, in a prior show, how do you personally know that you were saved? And you were saying that one of the attributes of being saved is having uh, um, uh, a total aversion to committing any sin and, and feeling bad about that. And, and that's one of the characteristics, I should say, of, of one of the people, of people being saved or people that have been yeah, saved. You know, let me, let me make a comment about that uh, during these last couple of uh, open forums uh, there have been those who have come after me wanting to know am I saved and am I the only one that has discovered this and I as I answer I tend to uh, stutter a little bit I tend to sound like I'm evasive a little bit and the reason is 
I uh, honestly am very uncomfortable being in the spotlight. In this world, one thing that mankind wants is to be noticed, to be great, to uh, be uh, honored in some way. And frankly, uh, I am just a servant of the Lord. I am nothing. And it's very uncomfortable for me when people are trying to ask me, well, what about you? And are you the only one? And so on and so on. Uh, Because I don't want to boast. I don't want to uh, be egotistical. I want... I pray every day that I might walk humbly before the Lord. So I can tell you, those personal questions are are difficult for me. Uh, Not because I'm trying to hide something. I really am not trying to hide any. I'll tell you, I've been on this program for over 45 years. My life is an open book. Uh, uh, People know what kind of a house I live in and what kind of a car I drive. And I've been asked all kinds of personal questions. But, and I... And I try to answer, but when, uh, but uh, uh, at the same time, knowing that this is the the uh, characteristic of mankind to be proud, to be uh, recognized. Everybody wants to uh, be a, a big name of some kind. That's the last thing that I want, and and uh, so it, it's very. These questions become very difficult for me, and and that's why I tend to stutter a little bit and and almost sound like I'm evading the question. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. A couple questions. Um, Had you ever checked into the website um, www.hebrewisraelites.org? Israel... HebrewIsraelites.org. I'm sorry, I've never looked at that. It talks about um, um, you know, instead of like um, praying to God and Jesus, it talks about praying to Yah and Yahoshua. Well, I don't know what they're saying, but I do know what the Bible says. And the Bible predicted already 2,000 years ago that they would again become a viable nation amongst the nations of the world. And that was a remarkable prediction because in A.D. 70 they were completely destroyed by the by the Romans and they were they they lost the land of Israel and they no longer operated for almost 1900 years operated did not operate as a nation at all. And on top of that not only did the Bible predict that they would become a nation again at some time in the future, but that they would never, never turn to Christ as their Messiah. Uh, 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 even though uh, Christ is the is the, the biggest and most wonderful and marvelous blessing that ever came out of national Israel. And both of those prophecies have be, become fulfilled in these last 60 years. And uh, that... Uh, and that is why what we see in Israel is there's nothing that is different than what the Bible predicted. But they will never turn to Christ. They've already been in their land for 60 years as a nation. And uh, and they're just as far away from turning against Christ as Messiah as they ever have been in their 4,000 years of history. Um, in the Hebrew text is... Yah, the Almighty Creator, and Yehoshua, Yehoshua, um, the Messiah. Well, the Christ is is the Messiah. Christ is the Messiah, but he's not recognized as the Messiah by the nation of Israel. Uh, they don't want any part of that. Although there are, there's a remnant. There's a few true believers coming out of Israel, even as the Bible did predict. But as a nation, no. And you would think that given the enormous impact that Christ has had on the world, that even though they disagreed with the theological position of Christ, they at least would be proud of the fact that he was a Jew. He came from the line of Abraham and David, which he did. And But no, no, there's nothing like that officially coming out of Israel. 
but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Um, I'm trying to understand in your book, we are almost there, uh, pages 26 and 27, where you talk about Jesus' birth being October 2nd, um, the Day of Atonement, which is the seventh month, the tenth day. And then um, it appears you say that the first day of the first month of the Jewish calendar would could be only as early as March 7th. So if you go from March 7th and you go seven months and ten days, you get to October 17th. So I was wondering how you how you got October 7th. Well, wait a minute. Where, where did October 17th come from? I, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't say anything about October 17th, I don't think. No, no. What I'm saying is that um, the first day, because you have in um, your book, on page 26 that um, it says um, we learned that the first month of each year began as close to the spring vernal equinox as possible but no earlier than 14 days before the spring equinox which is March 21st so 14 days earlier is March 7th right? Well I you know I uh, may, may I uh, suggest this? Before you, uh, before you begin to raise questions, you, you, there are a, a number of questions that can be raised uh, uh, when you begin to read the book, because as I indicated there that the first development of the timeline of history was uh, somewhat a, of a shaky structure. In other words, uh, 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 proofs were not uh, found yet as to whether I was doing this correct or not, although as uh, this has been developed over the last uh, 20 or 30 years and, and uh, uh, each time it's all been done very carefully. But it's only when you get right near the end of the book that you begin to, and now we're, we're looking at the structure, and, and you can shake it a little bit maybe. Uh, it's not really solid. But then come the proofs, and the proofs land right, land us right on those dates and cannot be one day away so that we know absolutely the, the, the preliminary work had all been done accurately. Otherwise, the proofs would not come out. And so I would suggest that before you, uh, you, you will have some questions early on, but finish the reading of the book very carefully and then see once what questions you still have. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing tonight, Brother Campin? Very well, thank you. It seems like you're getting stronger and stronger each night as you go. And I thank God for you. But I have a question for you. It seemed to me like the uh, excuse evangelical... Me. Uh, excuse me, would you be kind enough to turn your radio off? But we're getting some feedback. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It seemed like to me that the evangelicals and the liberals and the conservatives all seem to be a bunch of racist people, and all of them think they are oh, safe. Oh, oh, please, 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 please. I don't like you. I have you talk that way. We don't want to call names, and uh, we, uh, we can have our, uh, we can think this or think that, but it's not kind of call names and they uh, uh, everyone <laughs> is trying to live out his life as best he can and uh, if we want to call names look in the mirror please look in the mirror because uh, I'm the one each one of us are, is the one that has to be judged Not we don't point the finger at anybody else and so please please don't on this program begin to call people names well, okay, how can anybody be saved when they have hate in their heart? Then how what? How can anybody be saved when they have hate in their heart? Well, but that's the nature of man. How can anybody become saved, period? Not one of us can become saved. Nobody has got a corner on uh, being able to become saved. Or God has to do the saving. And, he did, and the Bible insists that he came for sinners. He came for sinners. 
uh, uh, Christ died for sinners and not for good people. And so, and it's not for us to point out sin. I'll tell you, you, you uh, can look in any direction at any human being and look for a little bit and maybe not long at all and you're going to see sin. You are going to see sin because that's the nature of this world. And, and uh, that's why I always say look in also in the mirror uh, that because you're going to see sin in your own life. And that's where you have to go to work on it to try to uh, er eradicate that sin, crying out to God for mercy, crying out that you might become a child of God. Because once we become a child of God and we have been given a brand new resurrected soul, then we find we can really begin uh, to make a frontal assault on the sin in our life because we, we have such an increased and enormously increased desire to be obedient to the law of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. I was hoping to uh, get your viewpoint on what, what appears to be a, a disturbing characteristic of God. Um, and to use as an example would be the, the Babylonian exile. Where it appears that, you know, God was using the Babylonian Empire to punish Israel for the transgressions that it, it had committed. But then, at the end of the exile, he seems to turn around and accuse the Babylonian Empire of sinning because of what he did to his holy city and to the Israelites. Well, well you, you're putting your finger on a very interesting uh, problem, and that is sin is, is, is there. Sin is there. And just because God can use a sinful person to accomplish his pur purpose, that doesn't mitigate, that doesn't uh, cut down the fact that that person is living in sin. For example, I use this illustration all the time because it's so easy. Uh, the ten brothers of Joseph sold Joseph as a slave in Egypt. Hold on, I'll be right back with you. Talking about the ten brothers of Joseph. Now, they hated Joseph. That was a big... We have a problem. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the ten brothers of Joseph. And they hated it, Joseph, their 17-year-old brother. That means they, they were guilty of grievous sin. And they had murder in, within their heart. They first threw him, uh, when they got him out alone, out in the, uh, out in the uh, uh, wilds of the, where they were tending their sheep, they threw him into a pit with the idea that they were going to kill him. And then they finally came up with a substitute idea to sell him as a slave to some passing Ishmaelites that were coming by. And what a terrible thing, because as a slave, he could end up where? Just under any kind of a horrible situation. And it was a cruel thing that they did. And yet, later on, Joseph, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says to them, you know, you meant it for evil. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You ask the question. It was God's intention that by the time Joseph was 30 years of age, 13 years later, in other words, he would be the second in command of the nation of Egypt. Now, how do you go from uh, being uh, just a a, a brother of the, of the other ten brothers, a 17-year-old uh, uh, brother, to that position in 13 years. Well, God is going to do it all, but he has laid it out by beginning the fact that he's being sold as a slave in, so that he ends up in Egypt. That gets him into Egypt, and then God begins to work with him there to develop the situation until finally... He is the second in command in, uh, in the land of Egypt. And so 
God uses the wicked of the world, the evils of the world, to accomplish his purposes. That does not justify in any sense the wickedness. That does not lessen the guilt of those that are committing that wickedness, but is simply that God is, is indicating that he is in charge of this whole world. And he finally uh, will use whatever he wishes to use. He can use uh, people who are true believers. He can use the most wicked of the world, like Satan, which he really is right now, as he has assigned him the task of running all of the churches, the congregations all over the world. Right, and the difference, though, is where I see with the warnings that God gives to Jeremiah and Isaiah and about uh, the punishment that it seems to always be, I will bring a sword, I will do something, which it seems to indicate that he is going to, through his supernatural powers, he is going to will the Babylonian Empire to do what they they finally carried out doing. Well, of course. So I, I'm, it just kind of you know raises a question: Would they have done that otherwise? Had not God forced them to do that to uh, Judah? Well, I don't don't use the word force them. They did what comes naturally. They were the enemy of Judah. And normally God was protect, protecting Judah from these kind of enemies. And then, but then God finally decides now I'm going to use their, their enmity against Israel uh, to accomplish my purpose. So he even says I will put hooks in their jaws uh, 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 to bring them against, it, uh, against Judah. And uh, this, this doesn't lessen the fact that it is Babylonian, the Babylonian sin. In fact, God very carefully, after he discusses what he has done with these wicked nations, then he turns around and says, and I will punish Babylon. They're going to be severely punished because they did these things. God simply opened up the, the way for them to do what comes naturally. But thank you for calling and sharing And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The number, incidentally, to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Hello. Yes, welcome. Go ahead, go ahead with your call. I have a question. Oh, excuse me, would you turn your radio off? We would appreciate it. Uh, I just want to I know if you believe in dispensation of grace today. Do. Can you read uh, Ephesians 1, 7, please? Do I believe in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7? Is that your question? Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse verse 7. There we read, uh, In whom, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of of his grace absolutely now when it says that through his blood it means that he gave his life he died uh, and and had to come to life again to be our savior and uh, and by this means because he made the payment demanded by the law of god which ends up with death and finally the second death the total annihilation because he uh, took our place in all of this. Therefore, there is forgiveness of sins. We are under grace today, sir. I'm sorry? We are under grace. Well, grace. You, you, for the, today? The death Do you believe we are under grace today for salvation? 
the definition of grace is the free gift of salvation. The free gift of salvation. That is the grace of God. And anybody who has become saved has is under grace. He has received the free gift. He ba- paid absolutely nothing for it. The free gift of salvation. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, Brother Campy, I was uh, wanting to know, um, when you say uh, Judgment Day is um, May 21st, uh, 2011, is that uh, the rapture? Is that the actual Judgment Day? And can you tell me where in the Bible it it says uh, those dates? Well, the, uh, to find those dates, that's that. Is, uh, Excuse me. Could you could you answer my first question first? That when you say um, um, May twenty first, two thousand eleven, yeah. what? Yeah, the um, day, What what is that day supposed? What is supposed to happen? When May uh, up until May twenty one, two thousand eleven, it will be business as usual. We read in Matthew twenty four. Matthew 24. Let's turn to that a minute. Matthew 24, for in verse 38, verse 37, But as the days of Noah uh, were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now the Son of Man, of course, is the Lord Jesus. For as in the days that were before the flood... They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. All right. Now Christ is coming for two purposes. One purpose is to catch up all the true believers in the heaven because they have no part in the day of judgment. Uh, they, uh, they, he's coming. He's going uh, to throw open the to- all the tombs and the bodies of the true believers who are going to be caught up and, and, and go to heaven on that day. And the, those who are true believers and have not died will instantly be changed into a glorified spiritual body and be caught up to be with Christ. And this will all be done in the sight of all those who are left behind. But it is also the day that begins the day of judgment. Now, just like uh, God took six days to create the heavens and the earth, and then he uh, sums it all up. In the day that God created the heavens and the earth, so... Uh, the day of judgment is spoken of as a single day, even though we find in studying the Bible very carefully, it encompasses a period of 153 days. And during that 153 days, the, those who are, uh, enter into that period, and, uh, and that'll be like more than six and a half billion people, it won't be a, a small thing at all. Uh, they will, uh, they will die of plague. Uh, they will die of other one disaster after another. They'll be under the punishment of God until finally, on the last day of the 153 days, any that are still left alive will be completely destroyed by fire. The whole universe will be destroyed by fire. It will cease to exist. The whole business of planet Earth will be gone forevermore. So is that the rapture? The, no, the rapture is on the first day. The rapture is when the graves are thrown open and the I'm people saying, is are it, caught it, up uh, to be... Pardon? Is May 21st, 2011, is it the rapture that day or is it judgment day that day? It's both. It's both. It's the day that the true believers are raptured and it's also the first day of the day of judgment. The will be caught up in heaven, and then judgment day will, will come. What about the three and a half years of uh, Daniel's tribulation? 
Oh, well, now, there's a lot of information in the Bible that has to be integrated into all of this. And, and uh, uh, ahead of this 153-day period uh, and ahead of this first day of the rapture, uh, there has been a period of 8,400 days. That is called in the Bible the period of great tribulation. It's a period of testing time. And uh, during the first 2,300 days, uh, and incidentally, we know exactly when this began. It began in, in on May 21 in the year 1988. And then uh, for 2,300 days until September 7, 1994, virtually no one became saved. God's judgment is is beginning to fall on the whole world, particularly on all the congregations. No one is being saved. But then, for the sake of the elect, there are a lot of people yet that God has not saved, and yet He had planned to save them. On September 7, 1994, uh, which was 2,300 days after the beginning of this period the Bible calls Great Tribulation, God again poured out His Holy Spirit, not in the churches. They remained under the wrath of God, under the judgment of God. Uh, There was no change for them. They remained under the the rulership of Satan that had begun uh, at the beginning of the 2300 days. But out in the world... There, uh, God uh, poured out His Holy Spirit so that the last 6,100 days of the 8,400, subtract 2,300 from 8,400, you have 6,100 days exactly. During that period, God now is saving a great number of people all over the world, not utilizing any church at all, not utilizing any uh, organization, as it's, to be, it's between God and that individual. The role of, of an organization like Family Radio is we have no spiritual rule over anybody. We are simply uh, a teacher. We are try, trying to encourage people to read the Bible because it's between God and that individual as he reads the Bible and, and also uh, helping them uh, to give uh, to uh, understand some of the difficulties of Bible uh, uh, of what the Bible is teaching, but we have no spiritual rule over anybody. And during that 6,100 days, there's a great multitude being saved, and they, at the end of that 6,100 days, is May 21, 2011, which is the time of the rapture, which is the time of the beginning of the day of judgment. But thank you for calling and sharing. And all of this is carefully laid out in the book. We're almost there. And in another few days, we'll have a a second volume. uh, uh, It's not, it's it's a a follow-up on it, which the title of the book uh, 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 to God be the glory, because all of this that's going on is to the glory of God, in which there is a lot more information about the nature of God's judgment plan right up till the end. And uh, all of this is is what we're now learning from the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question about um, does the Old Testament prophesy both coming of Christ, one as a, a Savior and the second as a judge? My understanding of the Old Testament is that um, God promised to send a Savior, but I don't, I don't see anything that says that he will come first as um, Savior, and then he will return as a judge. And the Old Testament I'm talking about, does the Old Testament speak about these both coming? That is my question. Well, uh, the, the Old Testament, first of all, 
Uh, the Old Testament is very big and very complex, and there's a lot of information that we don't realize is there, that it is there. And so I can't answer your question whether it talks about and give you specific verses that relate to this. But I'll tell you, the Old Testament is, uh, is amazing at how much truth there is in it. But we do know this, that God, the whole Bible, has, really has always, like in the Psalms, for example, when we read the Psalms very carefully, they prophesy of him coming as the judge. They prophesy of him coming as the, uh, to, to be the savior. That, and, and then later on we learn that it was not to make payment for our sins when he comes, when he came in 33 A.D., but that he came to demonstrate how he made payment for our sins. And all of this uh, uh, comes together bit by bit, a little piece here and a little piece there, until finally we begin to understand the whole picture more so than ever before. But thank you. A follow-up question on that. So um, when Christ died on the cross and he said, it is finished, so it was finished, why did, um, why did this world continue to be in existence and life continue if it was finished? Well, the fact is, when he said, it is finished, he was not saying, now I have finally paid for the sins of those that I came to save. That's the way we used to understand it when we had not the whole, uh, lot, a whole lot of information uh, that God now has opened our eyes to. When he said, it is finished, you see, the, what was happening from the time that Christ was born all the way until he went back to heaven is that this is like a huge parable. I call it a tableau. It's like a, uh, it's a, it's a three-dimensional picture. A parable is, is a portrait or a picture of something spiritual. And the portrait doesn't necessarily follow in exact detail. For example, when God uh, uh, did such things as uh, uh, used the uh, raising of a, of a dead man or of healing the eyes of someone who was blind or healing a leper, all of these were tableaus. That is, they were three-dimensional pictures. Now, when that man was blind and could not see, he was a portrait of a, the fact that before we're saved, we are spiritually dead and we uh, have no spiritual eyesight. But it, there's a, a lot about uh, uh, our salvation that is not seen in that particular portrait, but there are some things seen. But the, the, the focal point is that even as that man received his spiritual eyesight, so when we become saved, we receive our uh, spiritual life and we can see we have uh, 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 we see Christ as our Savior and so on now that's the same way when Christ was born of the Virgin Mary God had to show for sure that when he made payment for our sins he had taken on a human nature he doesn't tell us how he did that but to demonstrate to us that he had really taken on a human nature we see that he was born of the Virgin Mary. Then we see him when he is uh, on the cross and he is being cursed. Now, it doesn't mean that he was on a cross back there before, uh, the, before the foundation of the world uh, to become a curse, but it does indicate he had become a curse. But to demonstrate that, God used a, a means that clearly showed someone was under the curse of God. Anyone who is hanging on a tree is cursed of God. And likewise, when he died, uh, he, he, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that it's showing exactly how he died before the foundation of the world, but it does show that he died. And so when he said it is finished, that was a major tableau, a major parable that had been finished. He still had to show another part of it, 
and that is that he's in the grave and yet when he's in the grave it isn't uh, it, it isn't exactly like he was in the dead and in the grave before the foundation of the world uh, because there it says thou will not leave my soul in hell and hell means death or the grave and he was taken out but when he was put in the grave uh, after the time of the cross he was not in the grave in his soul existence only in his body and so that's because it's a parable or a tableau it is demonstrating that he rose from the grave but it's not demonstrating every aspect of everything that occurred before the foundation of the world and that's that is uh, what but but the suffering that Christ endured was very real uh, even though it was not now making payment for sin that the suffering was first accomplished when he was still Christ before he was the son of God and that was very real and now as the son of God he had to suffer all over again without without a need to, to pay for any sins but simply to demonstrate to the principalities and powers and to all of us because it's written it's spread out on the pages of the Bible to demonstrate how he suffered in making payment for our sin. Thank you very much, Brother Kempe. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Kempe. I have two questions for you. Yes, go ahead. Um, I want your viewpoint. I'm curious to know, will we recognize our loved ones if we're chosen to go up to heaven to be with God? Will we recognize which? Our loved ones. Like, will I recognize, recognize my dad? Oh, I. we have no evidence that we will. You know, in this world, God has designed us. Remember, God is our creator, and he has designed us. So there's a very tight love relationship between members of a family uh, that is in order to, to make the human race develop it had to develop through the family that's where the children come from and so uh, God therefore put a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, natural love uh, between father uh, uh, husband and wife and between children and parents and and so on and therefore, uh, now, of course, as we're thinking about the future, we would like to continue that very intense love relationship into the hereafter and know that uh, this is my dad or this is my mom and so on. But once we are raptured, it's one by one. You two are in the field, one will be taken, the other is left. We, uh, we enter into a new kingdom all together where family does not play a part. We're all sons of God or we're all the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we uh, have no uh, memory of what has happened in this world at all. We don't know uh, whether our husband or our wife or, or this child or that child became saved we won't know that and it's not necessary that we know that because each one has lived out his life and and it's it salvation is a very individualistic kind of a thing but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take the next call please welcome to open forum yes uh good afternoon um calling regarding uh working on the Sabbath day. Uh, I mean, actually, I had a question. Uh, my name, by the way, uh, my name is Spencer Highland. I'm in Newark, California, and I appreciate your ministry. Uh, now, are, uh, when you talk about the Sabbath day, are you talking about Sunday? Yes, uh, Sunday. I, I was out of work for a couple of years, and I'm a little bit concerned um, regarding, uh, I went back and talked to the people that I uh, at the grocery store that I used to work at, and they asked me to work Sunday, and I told them I gotta have Sunday off for that is the uh, Lord's Day, 
Um, and uh, I, they said, well, can you at least work a four-hour shift on, on the Sabbath day, on Sunday? Yeah, and well. I told them, I'm not, I don't think I can, but uh, I just wanted to ask your input on that. Well, that's, that's a very practical question and a very difficult question. And certainly you want to be pleading with the Lord and begging the Lord, Oh, Lord, could this somehow be corrected? And go to your boss for one thing and say, You know, uh, first of all, show that you're a very fine workman. You know, work harder than anybody else. Make no complaints. And then go to your boss and say, You know... I, I, I really appreciate it that you gave me a job and that I've got four hours of work. Hold on, I'll be right back with you. This is a very practical, a very difficult problem because on the one hand, God has given us the Sunday Sabbath as a day for, for spiritual activity and not a day for work. Uh, now, it is true that a farmer has to milk his cows on Sunday. No question at all about it. He's got to milk his cows. Otherwise, he'll have a bunch of, uh, of sick cows on his hands. Uh, he, but he doesn't have to mow his, his alfalfa on Sunday. He can wait till Monday. Uh, he doesn't have to uh, paint his barn on Sunday. He can wait till Monday. But he has to milk his cows. And, uh, and do a minimum amount of work in connection with that. Now, but uh, on the other hand, here is you're living in town, and the grocery store is the only place that offers you a job, but you have to work four hours on Sunday. And I would, what I would do to begin with, uh, besides pleading with the Lord for, for help and for wisdom, and I'd really be pleading with the Lord for help and wisdom, the first thing I would do, I've got to show my boss that I am really thankful for this job, and I, uh, I there's no complaints that come from me. I'm really going the second mile when it comes to working as hard as possible. Then I would go to him and I'd say, you know, I'm really grateful for this job, but I, I'm having a horrible time with my conscience about this matter of working on Sunday, and I would be willing to work extra hours during the week, nighttime or whatever, uh, if, if only I could get, uh, you could make some kind of a, an arrangement where I did not have to work on Sunday any longer. And, uh, and uh, in the meanwhile, I would also start looking around. Maybe the Lord will provide another job. But it's something that, that you really... Uh, you really want to be working at in prayer, mainly in prayer, but also in trying to show that you are very, very thankful, and and uh, hopefully you won't have to work those four hours on Sunday any longer. And put this by the camping. Yes. Have a good evening. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Mr. Company, how, how you doing? Very well, thank you. All uh, right. I'm glad I take my call. I got a question for you. Uh, you say hell, uh, hell is equal to grave, is that right? I, I'm sorry, what is your question? You say the grave is equal to hell, is that right? The I, grave. I'm sorry, I'm still not... You said the, the grave. Oh, what, oh, what the grave. grave. The oh, grave. hell is the grave. Is yeah, equal you said it's hell. It, it equal hell, is that right? Yes, the hell is the grave. That, uh, uh, like, for example, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, that is recorded in in uh, uh, in uh, Luke 16, the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. But the poor man, he died and was buried. You see. Uh, uh, but the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now, wait a minute. When the rich man died, he was put in the grave. He was put in the grave. You don't, uh, a, a, a man that dies, anybody that dies is put in the grave. 
And so, uh, uh, go, but but it but it's a word that is translated hell because the translators don't understand, did not understand that hell and the grave are synonyms. Now, because it's a parable, therefore, in the grave, even though he he is dead. Uh, God uh, uh, God is, uh, speaks of him as if he's still living so that he can see into heaven and see Lazarus, his, uh, the poor man, in Abraham's bosom. Now, you, can't, you, know, you never can look from the grave or from any other place where the unsaved, where you might think they go into heaven, but in this, in this parable you can because it's a parable. And so he, from the grave... He has this this conversation with Abraham because God has a lot more to teach through this parable. Mr. Gumpy, Mr. Gumpy, what about uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41? Matthew 25, verse 41. 31? Oh, no, 41. Matthew 25. Verse 41, hell and be prepared for Satan and his angel. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Is that your question? Yeah, hell is yeah. real. Hell is not the grave. Well, now hell again. Hell is where Satan and his angel will dwell, the lake of fire. Yeah, well, everlasting fire... Uh, is means that it is it is a fire that is of such a nature that it you'll never never live again. It's like the uh, like the fire is forevermore. It's very s- significant that in the book of Jude, and God didn't put this here accidentally. This was here in order to teach us something. In the book of Jude, God says. I'm turning to that little book. Uh, he says of uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now they were destroyed in one night by fire and brimstone. And yet he says in verse 7 of Jude, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire well now okay there we have it eternal fire now we know we know where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be and yet any time after they were destroyed they have never never appeared again but there's no fire burning there either no fire burning there and yet they were destroyed by everlasting fire. So God is giving us a definition, namely that when you are subject to everlasting fire, it means you're completely destroyed and you'll never live again. Here is your here is the definition right here in Jude verse seven. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Sure, yes, could you turn your radio off, please? No problem. Um, glad I got through this evening. I have a, a couple questions to ask. Um, the first question is I've heard you mention several times on your radio program that believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is um, a work. And my question is in regards to Acts chapter 16, um, right around verse 31. Acts 16, let me turn to that. Acts 16, verse 31. There we read, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Yes, okay. Okay, so that's a part um, where, where the... Uh, um, they came to Paul and Silas, and they asked him, asked him 
the question, you know, what must we do to be saved? Believe it. But the problem is, this verse doesn't tell the whole story. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus. That's a characteristic. That's a good work that is seen in the life of those who do become saved. Uh, that uh, we, we are expected to do good works and to be obedient to the Lord in various areas, including that of believing. But the big question that's not answered here is, but how do I believe? I am dead in sins. My heart is desperately wicked. How can I believe? I, I, uh, that's a, that's, that's, that uh, is a work that I can't, I, I can't accomplish uh, w- without becoming saved. You first have to save me, then I will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so, uh, that, uh, that's the, that's the way God wrote the Bible, that unless we are comparing scripture with scripture, and taking into account and harmonizing all the scriptures that relate to the subject in question, we are not going to find truth. We're going to arrive at conclusions that are wrong or that are incorrect. And that's also the way this verse is looked at. People read that, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yeah, that's true. But how they, 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 the question is never raised, but then how do I believe unless God gives me faith, unless God gives me a brand new resurrected soul? Then, yes, I've become saved and I will believe on the Lord Jesus and, and uh, my salvation is secure. So then I would have to agree with that statement wholeheartedly and say that believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is the evidence that I have become saved, that he saved me, not through any work that I've done. Well, now, now again, believing is, there's a, there's a whole lot of uh, variety of believing. An unsaved person with a, with a rebellious heart, which we all have before we're saved, can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to some degree. He can believe definitely that Christ is the Savior, He can believe that Christ died and rose again. He can believe that without Christ there is no salvation, and so on and so on. He can believe a whole lot of things. But that doesn't mean that he is saved at all. He's just believing a a lot of things. But uh, but the work of faith, because believing is a... uh, Believing is a verb and faith is a noun, but it's the same word... Uh, the work of faith is something God does, that Christ does. And uh, as we go again to Galatians chapter 2, this says it. And unfortunately, this verse has been damaged in, in most Bibles. Uh, they have changed it uh, from the original Greek in order to satisfy their wrong uh, idea of what salvation is. What verse, verse 16. Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Now, believing is a work of the law. Okay. Uh, And so he's not justified by that, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, in Bible after Bible, uh, the translators, uh, in order to satisfy their idea of what salvation is, have changed that to read... Uh, but by the faith in Jesus Christ. And this, this, uh, the Greek of this will not allow that. It is in, it is the faith of Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Now faith is work and Christ has done all the work. He is the one that has saved us. That's why we read in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace, and remember grace is the free gift of salvation, are we saved through faith. Whose faith? The Lord Jesus' faith. The fact that he was faithful in making payment for our sins, and that not of yourselves. It is, that is, the grace is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. 
not of works, therefore not of your faith, not of your believing. That's a work that you do, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Uh, that is, unto such good works as believing on him and of uh, uh, love, uh, beginning to love the way we ought to. And, and just like the Bible talks about in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, tenderness, kindness, uh, all these things, uh, faith should be shown, would begin, should be shown or, or show up in the life of the true believer. Well, this this may be the only opportunity that I get to call in, so I'm I'm going to ask you my second question. What is a man who has several children um, pray with or or teach his children about the Bible or the Bible? The biblical to to salvation, and and do I just reassure them that that it's all up to God and God's going to work it out in them and through them? By no, the faith you, of Christ. You know, children have to repent. Children cry. I can cry out to mercy for mercy, just as readily as an adult. God tells us in Deuteronomy six, Deuteronomy six, where He's talking about bringing up our children, uh, and He's talking about these words, and these words means the whole Bible. Uh, these words, which. Uh, 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 well, let me start with verse 5. And thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day, that's the whole Bible, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Not just some of them, but you teach them everything you know from the Bible. And so you don't hesitate to talk to your children about sin and about the penalty for sin and the wrath of God and the fact that we've only a little more than two years left and it's all coming to an end. We should be talking very directly to our children as uh, uh, notice, thou shalt teach dil- them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou walkest in thine, when thou, when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. In other words, this ought to be the prime conversation going on in our houses in our homes that we're talking about uh, the importance of the Bible and what God is teaching. And uh, so that uh, uh, this is where we want to focus. You know, our uh, our children, uh, I often have thought about this, even in, as I raised our seven children. Uh, it's one thing to take your children to Sunday school or take them to church or when you put them to bed at night to pray with them and oh that's all fine but then during the day they can see how preoccupied dad and mom are with their plans for the vacation next month or for uh, building another room on the house or uh, buying some new furniture or about a restaurant that they went to uh, or about uh, some friends that they they learn this and that from these friends. And that becomes, all these things become the major topic of conversation. Then we go to our children uh, tr- trying to follow Deuteronomy and 6 and, and teach them the way of the Lord. And yet what they've been hearing 90% of the time is living in this world and enjoying this world. And so without us recognize it, we're just a bunch of hypocrites. A bunch of hypocrites. We are saying one thing to our children, expecting them uh, to now be fine, uh, really understand something about the Word of God. And yet, most of the time, as they are listening, believe you me, children have big ears. They they don't that that doesn't pass them by. That the, really the important thing 
about dad and mom is where they had uh, what restaurant they went to the last time and uh, what uh, the experience when they went on this vacation and so on and so that's what's really important to dad and mom oh yeah yeah they they tell, tell us about the lord jesus and we hear that but that really isn't important because they don't talk very much about that they really it's the things of this world that are really important and so we are just a big bunch of hypocrites and believe you me we can all look in the mirror on this matter to some degree and it's a it's a it's a terrible thing it's not fair to our children now that doesn't mean if we were able to do it exactly right that our children are going to be true believers that's up to god altogether but that's beside the issue the issue is are you being obedient to god this is a command of god that when we walk by the way when we lie down when we rise up we are teaching the things of the bible to our children and so our children ought to be a marvelous cudgel a marvelous discipline in our lives to keep our attention focused where it ought to be rather than where we would like to have it just because we live in a beautiful world but shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum uh, mr camping yes i was wondering have you ever thought of looking at uh, proverbs eight twenty two? proverbs eight twenty two. let's look at that proverbs eight twenty two. there we read the lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old uh, uh, the 23 also in verse 23 it says i was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was now we have to be careful with proverbs 8 the subject of proverbs 8 is wisdom wisdom and of course christ is the very essence of wisdom but we also must remember that christ is from eternity past as christ he is god he is god forevermore and he doesn't have a beginning at some time in the past he is christ but when he before he ever laid the foundations of the world before he did any creation he went through the whole business of making payment for our sins then he uh, he uh, took on a slightly different uh, uh, picture and we, we we can't understand this at all we just can't understand it but he was obedient in making in in uh, in being having the sins of all those that god planned to save once he began creation laid upon him and then he had to endure the wrath of god and all of that it's like he was a, a servant and in that sense he could identify with proverbs as a proverbs 8 as a servant he was faithful he was perfectly obedient all the way and finally he uh, was killed how did that happen we don't know and then he rose from the grave how did that happen we don't know that's all uh, happening happened before he ever created the world and then he now could be called the son of god the son of god now in proverbs chapter 8 i don't know whether it refers anywhere to the son of god i haven't gone through this uh, recently and so i really don't know but uh, but uh, we do know that it is a reference to christ and it would uh, it, it would appear to be that it would tie in with this fact that he became the son of God. Camping, excuse me. Did you know that the word set up meant poured like as a drink offering from everlasting? It's set up like we yes, find. Yes, that word means poured out. It's only used set up twice, but the rest of the time... It's like poured out, like a drink offering. 
Have you ever uh, looked that word up before? No, I don't. What verse are you looking at? 23 there. 23. I was set up. I was set up from everlasting. That word from, means poured out. Poured out from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. I was poured out from everlasting, that is, in everlasting past, before the earth was. That would fit if that really means poured out, and I, 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 I haven't checked it, but I take your word for it, that it means poured out, then yes, that verse fits very beautifully. Uh, Psalm 139, verse 15. Psalm 139, verse 15. There we read Psalm 139, verse 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Yeah, again, it's a very provocative sentence, and again, without really studying it word by word, I don't feel qualified to speak to it, but uh, uh, it's certainly what happened before the foundation of the world, when Christ made payment for our sins, was secret, totally secret. And that's why later on, 11,000 years later, or a little bit more than that, he had to come to demonstrate how that suffering did, uh, did uh, how, how he did suffer. But uh, thank you for these verses very much. And shall we take our last call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. <coughs> Welcome. Well, yeah. Mr. Camping, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I'd like your advice on one of my children. I have four altogether, two are out of college and on their own and married. My old my youngest boy in eleventh grade missed seventy days of school last year and had all Fs and stayed back. He started kind of like a mini revolution in his school because he believes everything that I believe in God and the Word. And my teachings to him has has led this on now. But is your son is in rebellion? No, he believes that the world is coming and there's only a couple years left. Yes, well, that's what uh, that he's correct, of course. That is accurate. So then he's asking, well, then why should I worry about college? And he stays uh, home and... He reads the Bible and just puts a lot of time into the Word. Well, I'll tell you, you better be thankful that you have a son like that. You better be really thankful because he's he is trying to make sure that he is prepared, that he is a child of God, and and there's nothing more important that should that he should be interested in than the Bible. But with that, I have to say good night. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.